This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Right, uh, it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nat Alcock, um, Emeritus of the University of Warwick, Doyen of a variety of things, including lots of vernacular architecture, crack frame buildings, West Country households, all sorts of bits and pieces. But that's none of which is what he's actually going to talk to us about today, which is um, travelling in Britain before the railway age, explored through, well, he would tell find us. Out. <laughs> yes. Uh, I apologise, this is not uh, a solid scholarly overview of 18th and early 19th century travel, but it's a look at what it was like on tour as seen by three uh, travellers who chose to record their experiences in diaries specifically for uh, their tours. Uh, I'm sure that writing diaries like this is a very human impulse. I've done it myself. Probably everybody here has done it. My great-grandfather wrote a diary in 1851 on his voyage to the gold fields in Australia. Frankly, it was rather dull. Um, but the diaries I've got are, some of them, slightly less dull, I think. Lots of diaries survive. The British Library has a dozen or more for travel in Britain. And, of course, there are the famous ones, Celia Fiennes, Boswell, and leaving all of those severely alone. But, uh, and I also draw people's attention, which somebody kindly did to me, to uh, an interesting and very useful book, The Observant Traveller, by Robin Gard of some 20 or so years ago, uh, which I wish I'd written, but uh, I didn't. Uh, the four uh, diaries that I've picked to illuminate uh, the traveller's experience are a very arbitrary choice, and it's really them discovering me that has led me to uh, give you this talk rather than uh, anything very systematic. Two come from the uh, British Library. I found them because the tours include Coventry, and kindly the cataloguer has included Coventry in his catalogue entry. And there they appeared, and I thought, well, what does this look like? So I went to have a look at it. Uh, the other two come from the Newdigate collection at Warwick Record Office, uh, which I've been doing uh, quite a lot of cataloguing on. Uh, they're not unknown, um, but they impressed themselves on me. And uh, sort of putting these together, all four journeys and the diaries share some uh, intriguing features. These were all clearly undertaken as sightseeing trips. The diaries uh, appeared to be personal for later rereading rather than for uh, other people. I think that's perhaps a conclusion that one might wish to, to qualify. You can see on the screen uh, where they went, uh, and um, you don't really have to write down the references unless you feel the, the urge, but there they are for you. Uh, slightly curiously, all the diaries are more or less incomplete. Uh, one, most frustratingly, because the notebook was full. Uh, no doubt he went on in another diary, in another notebook, but uh, we don't know. The others uh, tend to stop sort of towards the end of the, the tour, uh, and perhaps they felt they'd done everything that they wanted to record. It was just the homeward journey. Uh, but most of them recorded their itineraries separately, uh, or in addition to the diary themselves, who so we actually know where they went, even when we don't have uh, diary corresponding diary entries. I'll introduce the tours themselves briefly, then I'll look at who the travellers were, how they got about, where they went, where they stayed, what they say about the places, uh, and a bit about uh, what it cost. I'm going to concentrate on the 1809 tour uh, to the I don't know if you can see this arrow, the red one, uh, to the Lake District. Uh, this is one of the ones that has Coventry in its uh, description. Because I think this diary is particularly interesting. But I'll add to, to this vignettes from the uh, 1821 tour to North Wales, the 1766 tour to Scotland. Uh, bear in mind this is only 20 years after the 45, although that doesn't feature very prominently. Uh, and uh, firstly, uh, a tour around southern England in uh, 1748, uh, which does have a diary, but it also has an associated sheet listing the expenses uh, of the tour as they went around. It cost uh, Sir Roger Newdigate and his party £98 to travel from Harefield in Middlesex around uh, the south coast to Arbury in Warwickshire between the 26th of August and the 23rd of September 1748. 
And this is luxury travel. Uh, today's money, well, these conversions are fairly meaningless, but I reckon that's about £6,000. Uh, the principal traveller here, let's see if we get him, yes, here we are, as I said, slightly squashed, uh, ex elongated, but there we are. Uh, the, intense, the immensely wealthy Sir Roger Newdigate of Arbury Hall, with estates uh, at Arbury, uh, at Harefield, uh, near London, uh, and in uh, Derbyshire. And he was an indefatigable traveller and diarist. He went on the Grand Tour twice in 1738 to 40 as a young man and again in 1774 to 5, as well as making numerous journeys in England, filling diaries and notebooks with uh, sketches, itineraries, and descriptions. Uh, as on both these tours, he generally travelled with his wife Sophia and often with her sister Maria. Conyers, who never married. In fact, Sophia wrote the 1748 diary, though it's Sir Roger who kept the accounts. The um, 1821 diarist uh, is a young man, Llewellyn Mayrick, an Oxford undergraduate, travelling with his father Samuel. Samuel is a, a noted antiquary, and indeed many of you may have come across him, especially a collector of armour which was displayed in their home in Upper Cadogan Place, uh, where it was a tourist attraction and later became the uh, core of the armour collection of the Wallace collection. Curiously, though, uh, it was Llewellyn, who, not Samuel, who held the purse strings. Samuel had married injudiciously and had been disinherited by his father, Sir Samuel Merrick of Goodrich. Uh, I'm afraid Llewellyn's diary is frankly rather pedestrian. We'll see at the very end, if we have time, a bit of it. Uh, essentially a record of the country seats they passed and sometimes visited, the monuments in the churches, the quality or otherwise of their inns. But uh, they also visited Coventry, which is how I encountered their description. Finally, uh, the 1809 travellers are a very big mystery. We simply don't know who wrote this diary. We know his companions, who were Miss Wegg and Nancy. Wegg's an unusual name, and I think we can identify her as Elizabeth Wegg, of whom somewhat more later. But we can discover a lot about the diarist, if not his name. He was another indefatigable traveller. He mentions a tour to Scotland the previous year, 1808, uh, and was revisiting some of these sites in 1809. He was clearly well connected. In Kendal, he hired the landlord's horse, uh, rode over to Levens Hall, where he was welcomed by the owner, Howard, i.e. Uh, Mr. Fulk Greville Howard, and Howard pressed him to stay. And we also know that he and Miss Wegg had been to Blenheim, which is one place they visited before. I just wonder if he was George Samuel Wegg, uh, Elizabeth's brother, but the sort of description doesn't quite seem to fit that, and I don't have any other candidates uh, for his identity. So if anybody says, oh yes, that's so-and-so, please say it very loudly, but at the end. Mm -hmm. Well, next thing, how did they travel? The diaries make it clear that the Newdigates and the 1809 traveller were in coaches or travelling chariots with two or four horses hired with a driver or post boy from post inn to post inn. Uh, on one occasion in 1809, the ladies drove the horses while George, uh, I'd call him George, but I don't know who he was, uh, walked with them. And they might have uh, looked like one of these uh, tours here. But the diaries make it clear that the Mayricks were travelling quite differently. They had just one horse, their mare, uh, and they were driving themselves. So perhaps using a light one-horse carriage uh, like this one or, or this one here. And uh, I was relieved to discover that they did give the poor mare a day's rest on several occasions and the diary records them stopping to feed the horse at, at intervals. <coughs> For the carriage travellers, it's notable uh, how far they went, often 30 to 40 miles. Um, the maximum for the Newdigates was 75 miles from Kendall to Liverpool, and for the 1809 traveller, a remarkable 93 miles from Wakefield to Stamford, and two days later, 60 miles from Dayton in Cambridgeshire back to London. 
But both these very long journeys were unfortunately after the end of the diary text. We only got the itinerary carrying them round the end of their, uh, their journey. Uh, so that is the only thing we've got to tell us of their exploits. Uh, it's not surprising that the Merrick's <coughs> mare only took them about 15 or 20 miles in a day. Their longest day was 27 miles from Valle Crucis to Lanrust. While we're thinking about transport, we'll follow briefly uh, the Newdigates on their 1748 uh, tour. They, um, here we have not only the diary, but a sheet of expenses and also a notebook of sketches. And here, for example, are the first day's expenses. Uh, H and G, I think, is horses and, and groom, um, and meals at inns and their overnight stay or recorded. Uh, on this tour they visited various stately homes starting with the Duke of Newcastle's house at Claremont uh, and then to Mr Hamilton at Street Cobham. A house uh, they say uh, not worth seeing uh, but uh, let's see, yes here we are, uh, an extremely pretty uh, Chinese building encompassed with a plantation. Well, this is uh, in fact Painswick Park uh, still noted for its garden features though the Chinese pavilion, which looks absolutely gorgeous, seems not to survive. Uh, later in the tour, they went to Stonehenge, and we've got uh, a drawing of one of the trilithons you can see there, uh, and a plan. Uh, I sort of feel they didn't survey the plan, so they probably copied this from, uh, from the guidebook, or a guidebook, which one, I don't know. What I want to look at a bit more closely is their visit to the Isle of Wight. Uh, firstly, they were rowed around uh, Portsmouth Harbour uh, and went to see the Royal William and the Glorioso, the latter uh, a 70-gun Spanish prize and they made a, a page of notes which you can see there. Uh, this isn't in the diary but is in the separate sketchbook and there is the plan of the Royal William with some dimensions and a note about the Glorioso down the bottom. That cost them 13 shillings and sixpence. Then they took a small sloop, a sloop? The charming Sally of 26 tons, so not that small, but perhaps like this one here, uh, which uh, Howard's New Royal Encyclopedia of 1788 provides us with a useful uh, drawing of. Uh, they meant to go across to, Ca to uh, Newport, but they were actually becalmed and landed up in Cowes instead. Uh, and the next day they took the same or another sloop to see the needles. They sketched the needles, still look like that, uh, uh, no lighthouse, of course, in 1748. Um, and uh, then in the cavern at Alum Bay, they were served a cold collation. And what's rather nice is here they are in the cavern. Uh, the drawing is unlabeled, but it comes in this little sketchbook immediately following the needles. So I think we can see this as the ladies in the, the cavern having their collation uh, what this curious thing is in the middle, I'm not quite sure. I think maybe it's just the cave retreating into the, into the distance. Uh, they also travelled around the island, uh, the island in hired chaises and finally took sloop to Southampton uh, where no doubt their own coach uh, awaited them. And the sloops cost 16 shillings, 10 shillings and sixpence and 16 shillings respectively. Uh, we'll move on to follow the 1809 travellers in uh, more detail. Uh, he wrote his diary in a little notebook, six inches by two and a half inches, and here you see the full thing, 50 sheets interleaved with blotting paper, and he recorded uh, the itinerary on the front and back uh, covers. It seems extraordinary to me how busy he was, not only this tour a proper, proper, as recorded in his diary, from the 17th of July to the 2nd of September. But before then, he was rushing to and fro London, Oxford, Highgrove, Brightwell, Brightwell Compton, uh, and then on his return, hardly a pause, off again to Brightwell, Streetly, Tetsworth, Cuxham, and Tunbridge Wells. And indeed, he notes uh, 2,125 miles covered over the three months uh, from uh, July to uh, September and surely somebody one of you people uh, must say who is going to be traveling like this uh, and tell me who he was uh, we'll take a look first 
at how they got on as they passed through uh, the Midlands. Their uh, first sight sightseeing stop was Woodstock uh, and uh, Blenheim. Uh, our hero is extremely tart about the servants at Blenheim. It costs us a guinea to satisfy them, who, like sharks, were watching for prey. It's a shame that the nation which paid for building Blenheim should pay also for looking at it. <laughs> and this is the sort of thing that's attracted me particularly to uh, this tour. They stayed the night at Chapel House uh, and went on to Warwickshire and Holford, where they breakfasted, no doubt, in uh, what was then the Bell Inn, now the Bridge Inn, uh, and uh, walked in the Bowling Green, which still survives opposite the inn, where the neighbouring gentlemen meet and play every Friday. Uh, the Bowling Green is in better order than any I've seen. Archives of Holly and Yew with benches. And I'm just waiting for the opportunity of uh, a little conference on sporting events to report that the archives of the Holford Gentlemen's Bowling Club from the 1780s survive at Warwick. So uh, there's an opportunity to do a little bit of exploring there. They went on to uh, Warwick, uh, somewhat incommoded by Sir Giles Mordaunt of Walton Hall, whom they saw driving his barouche and four towards the town and throwing dust in their eyes. Uh, he noticed a field of cape wheat, the ear of which was very short and thick, and a field of drilled turnips and lime used as manure. These are his sort of insight, I think, insightful comments. The visit to Warwick Castle is described in detail, including the Etruscan vase in the greenhouse, i.e. the orangery. Uh, this is it now in the Burrow collection. You will remember the scandals of thus many years ago when it was sold. Uh, they then went on to uh, Coventry, visiting Kenilworth Castle on the way, including the uh, gatehouse. I'm sorry, that was um, a premature there. At the gate, we were assailed, this is at Kenilworth Castle, by an innumerable, innumerable bevy of children begging, nor could we help noticing that the soil must be prolific in the extreme. Every house door was stuffed with brats and the road swarmed. They entered Coventry about eight o'clock through a narrow, dirty and blackguard street, drove to the King's Head and sought repose for the night, a good house with excellent beds. They did visit the cathedral and noticed the statue of Peeping Tom on the facade of the inn. There it is in this engraving, uh, but that was about all. Uh, the verdict on the town was, it's a dirty looking city with narrow streets, the houses most built of brick, the population is great, occasioned chiefly by the manufacture of ribbons. We saw one poor family at their looms and admired the dexterity with which they threw the shuttle and preserved the regularity of the pattern which they were weaving, for which purpose the feet are very constantly em employed. I'm afraid I haven't found an illustration of a, uh, a contemporary uh, ribbon-weaving loom to see these people in action. Uh, from there to Birmingham, they lunched at the Hen and Chickens and walked about the town a bit, but then went to see Mr Clay's paper manufactory making tea boards. The diary gives a long description of these sheets of paper pasted together, a sort of papier-mâché, that's my interpolation, dried, polished, painted and varnished, looking like wood and of high value, some of them decorated with Chinese fancies, and perhaps uh, cribbed from the web, this chinoiserie tray was the sort of thing uh, they were producing. The offcuts were made into buttons by machines, which were painted to match any cloth. They then went to the whip manufactory, which had a patent machine to bind the handle with 16 threads at a time, and the travelling salesmen carried with them large patterns of whip handles, the fashions of which were ever varying. Next came the pin manufactory. He and the ladies were pleased to see the drawing and stretching of the wire, followed by pointing, cutting, heading and whitening. The heading is done mostly by small children, whose fingers not unfrequently suffer by being struck with the machine which hammers on the head. They dined at the Hen and Chickens and took chaise for Litchfield, 16 miles away, where they lodged at the George Inn about nine o'clock. A busy day and I think a rather unexpected one. Now I'll digress here because the Mayricks in 1821 also visited Coventry and Birmingham, though their route was different, going from Coventry to Litchfield and then Birmingham on their way west. In Coventry they also stayed at the King's Head but did much more sightseeing. Their summary was much to gratify the curious traveller but an ill-favoured and dirty town. We'll all agree about that. They looked at the major sites, 
the churches and St Mary's Hall, which we see there, uh, the oldest specimen of domestic architecture. We can see this also through the precisely contemporary eyes of W. H. Brook, who compiled a book of watercolours sketches on a visit to Coventry in 1809 to uh, 20. The Merricks mention the nearby house, which still uh, stands, this one in the centre there, uh, and also, uh, who, oh, I'm sorry, whose gable was ornamented with curious wooden carved work, which indeed it still is. Unexpectedly, they also mention old houses in Well Street that Brook uh, again recorded. Uh, so those are the ones on the uh, right of the screen there. We also saw a procession, fireworks, celebrating the coronation of George IV. Uh, in Birmingham, they visited Thomason's repository, uh, a display centre for the productions of the town, and they commented that the angry hum of the inhabitants, the smoke of furnaces, and the effluence from the fusion of iron, copper, and tin render it extremely disagreeable. So not such a sympathetic view as our 1809 uh, traveller. Uh, returning to those travellers, I'll skip rather rapidly th the, uh, over their journey through Derbyshire, Cheshire, the Liverpool and Manchester Canal and Lancashire, with just a few uh, of their incidental experiences. Uh, the savage bull they met near, near Islam in Derbyshire with broken horns and his front covered with a network of thin iron. What on earth that's about, I don't know. At the Castleton Cavern, or also in Derbyshire, they seem to have been more struck by the beggars pestering them at the cave mouth than by the caves themselves, which they say very little about. Uh, on the road in Lancashire, uh, most curious thing this, the driver hired with the horses at Ormskirk greatly displeased him as he insisted on riding on the coach box rather than, I suppose, on the lead horse. He, he suffered, though, the driver, as his colleague driving the servants received a three-shilling tip, but he only got two shillings. Mm. We'll pick up their travels in more detail as they come to their principal destination, the Lake District. This section of the tour took from the 31st of July, when they arrived at Lancaster, to the 13th of August uh, at Keswick. Uh, and for this, the diary uses 80 pages, uh, so I can't quite manage it all uh, in the little time I've got here. Uh, and then they went on, uh, according to their itinerary, uh, to the 17th at Penrith, uh, and then on uh, back down the east coast, as we saw on the overview uh, map. Uh, as you'll see, this was a two-centre holiday, spending four days at the Lowood Inn by Lake Windermere, and then seven at the Royal Oak uh, at Keswick. Uh, even before they reached Lancaster, our traveller had favourable comments on his surroundings. The windows in the towns and villages in good houses and in cottages have many hydrangeas with large and beautiful blossoms painted in them. I have never seen any sort of a comment like this about this period, but maybe somebody uh, has uh, encountered this before. He didn't think much of the Royal Arms at Lancaster, but their next stop at Kendall was a different matter. We have great reason to be pleased with the moderate charges of our landlord. We had excellent dinners at two shillings apiece. Mr Webster at the Commercial Inn Kendall is one of the most civil and best landlords I have met with. He was also impressed by the character of the Westmoreland people who regularly touched their hats or bent the knee. This contrasted with the sharks who looked ready for deeds of darkness at the Castleton Caverns in Derbyshire. We mentioned them already. They moved on to Windermere uh, on the 3rd of August. Uh, there are the, the deeds of... No, that's the excellent... Um, Staying at the uh, Lowood Inn, uh, praised in all guidebooks as delightfully placed on the margin of a small bay from which the head of Windermere unfolds itself with exceeding grandeur. Uh, and that comes from Ford's description of scenery in the Lake District, 1839. And indeed, I think is still uh, a valid uh, description. They made various, various visits, uh, including one to Rydal, admiring Rydal Mount, a neat house belonging to a Mr. Worth. Well, this sounds awfully like William Wordsworth, mm. though he's only supposed to have gone there in 1813, and the um, uh, curator of the Rydal Mount Museum is baffled by who Mr. Worth is. So whether Wordsworth had a visit there nobody knows about, or whether somebody else with the same name uh, remained to be 
uh, discovered. They mainly toured around, being rowed across the lake and admiring the sublime scenery, as here the view back to, to Lowood in a more or less contemporary uh, lithograph. Uh, on the uh, 5th of August, though, they made an immense uh, trip, uh, no, mess, no less than 65 miles, uh, travelling presumably with their own coach, but changing horses, uh, starting at 6am down to the south of Windermere, to Alverston, Furness Abbey and Connors Head Priory, then back via Coniston and across the lake to Lowood, getting back at 9.30pm. Their main objective seems to have been the ironworks, or rather the pits, as the diary says, near Alverston. Uh, there's a long description commenting on the uh, ore uh, and the furnace and the red staining everywhere, uh, and also uh, the trouble they had with one of the horses hired at Alston, which suffered us an attack of colic and it insisted on lying down, but had to be whipped up in order to prevent it, I suppose, from expiring. And finally, at the bottom of uh, the Lake District, on to uh, Furnace uh, Abbey uh, before starting on their way back. Their stay at Keswick was broadly similar at the Royal Oak, belonging to Mr. Basin, an opulent banker of the town. They ascended Skiddaw on horseback. The diarist rode out alone to see the Druid stones, i.e. the Castle Rig stone circle, though he had less to say about it than Keats a dismal, dismal circ of druid stones upon a forlorn moor. And the party were rowed down Derwent Water to the Lodor Falls and on to the extraordinary Bowder Stone, 67 feet high, uh, seen here in a mid-19th century, a uh, well, splendid image, uh, and it describes it here uh, so narrow and so broken that two persons placed one on each side may shake hands uh, under it. Over then to Buttermere, uh, where they saw the, the Lawton Yew, uh, celebra celebrated by Wordsworth in his poem Yew Trees. The Yew still survives, though uh, it's much reduced in size after a great storm in the earlier 19th century. Originally it had a trunk 27 feet in, in circumference. And they also saw uh, Mary Robinson, the maid of Butterworth, uh, who of course is one of the most romantic figures of the age, uh, and again mentioned by Wordsworth. Uh, she was famed for her bigamous marriage with the impostor John Hatfield. Uh, the party had dinner at the inn she and her mother kept, and the diarist comments on her interesting appearance, her figure good, and her countenance, though not handsome, full of expression. Uh, rather less tritely, her mother was uglier than the ugliest of Macbeth's witches, <laughs> of the skin and bone, not the flesh and blood species. Uh, they were taken round the Keswick area by one Thomas Hutton, who kept an extremely curious collection of minerals, birds, coins, etc. Uh, he was commended as one of the most intelligent men the diarist ever saw or heard of, and very communicative, unassuming and without affectation. And I was delighted to find for uh, A to A uh, a mention of Hutton and Keswick together, which give us at Warwick Record Office uh, from the Thomas Pennant Papers uh, two versions of the catalogue of his collection so we can illustrate the sort of things he was seeing including his great eagle and all sorts of other most curious stuff. Uh, sadly with their departure from Keswick on the 14th of August for the west uh, and then the north we have to take leave of our diarist and his fair companions at least until the next volume of the diary should come to light. Uh, to finish with, I thought we should follow our other travellers on a small part of their journeys, and I've chosen the, rem the remotest portions of their travels, the Newdigates in the Highlands and the Mayricks in West Wales. Uh, interestingly, for the Newdigates in 1766, we have s two separate diaries, one by Sir Roger Newdigate, the other by his wife, uh, Sophia. And we also have uh, a few uh, sketches, not as many as for their 1748 trip, and most of the ones we do have are castles and sites in the north of England rather than in the Highlands. And, and we've also got uh, Sir Roger's own uh, diary, uh, which is kept in a very small uh, appointment book for the year. Uh, it's one of the 56 consecutive volumes from 1751 to 1806. 
uh, and this gives uh, his itinerary and uh, notes of uh, the expenses. And here's a bit of that that small uh, diary just as they start off uh, from Arbury. Uh, it's uh, just about legible. Uh, it's much more legible actually on the screen than it is in reality. He's got a tiny hand. Uh, and um, they started off in a coach with Sophia, who is there, uh, just the top there, S.Y. Uh, his, her sister, Maria Conyers, uh, and Mrs. Millicent Parker, his cousin, the daughter of his, his uncle, Francis Newdegood, and Wormsley, who we think must be their only servant they travelled with. The main diary of this tour is certainly St. Sir Roger's, thankfully a bit more legible than this little uh, memorandum book. Uh, going north, they were particularly interested in castles and the Pictish Wall, uh, Hadrian's Wall, and there are several plans of castles, but I'm going to skip all of these, uh, and Edinburgh, and Schoon Palace, and Glam's Castle, though I uh, sort of intervene a little bit with Methven uh, Castle uh, before they get to Glam's. Uh, at uh, Meth Methven, just west of Perth, Sir Roger noted Mr. Smith's Methven Castle a large house well situated and planted with two round towers at the angles and also the numbers of little carts with one man and one horse carrying stone to the military road uh, and in another part numbers leading hay to their lord's rick. The very fine bridge of five arches at Cooper Angus uh, they mention but it wasn't finished and the coach had to be drawn by men over a very dangerous occasional bridge of boards hardly safe for horses. At Dunkeld they visited the cathedral and Sir Roger comments the style of architecture is particular with an accurate thumbnail sketch in the margin uh, of the diary and you can see uh, it actually matches the reality extremely well. He was a very good observer. They also saw the very extraordinary natural curiosity called the Rumbling Brig, uh, a natural bridge over the torrent, uh, a very fine fall of the river foaming and wholly broken into froth from when she passes under the arch. And this seems to be a reference to the Black Lynn Falls, which you see there. And there are other references to this natural bridge in the 19th century, but nothing today. So I fear that bridge must have fallen sometime uh, in the past. Uh, on their way to Dunkeld, they did see uh, a little highland village making indeed a miserable appearance. The walls of turf and turf the cover, no glass to the holes for windows, if there are doors. And later on, several wretched little villages, stone walls, turf roofed, without glass or chimney, the point of the gable end in several serving to let out the smoke. And I picked that out particularly because I think that's the only comment of that type in any of the diaries uh, that I saw. Um, along Loch Tay, uh, the mountains are so steep in, on both sides that they admit no passage uh, even to on foot along its sides. The view of them is great but horrible, the small and cultivated spots rather expose the barrenness and poverty of the country of climate. At Tiendrum, which is situated in the centre of four glens or valleys at the division of Bredelbane and Argyle counties, a surprising wildness about it, vast mountains close up the glens, the Manubia that through we pass, then Bandorin in Argyle, with its wonderful sharp top, uh, that to the north, and two vast mountains hanging over Tiendrum in one of which a lead mine is worked. The miserable poor inn and village though, though at the meeting of two great roads. And here we've got the diary and their own immediately recognisable view of the mountain here. And you can see that's what it looks like. Uh, again, according to the web, and I think it's been uh, elongated a bit sideways. I think it's actually steeper than that. At their next stop at Inverary, they ran into difficulties. Got to the town of Inverary, where we found an ill, an inn too full to take us in, had not the politeness of some officers made room. They invited us into a ball where they were dancing, dancing Scotch reels, and which they call Cispays, we can recognize Strathspays there, and were very obliging. Uh, and that's Sophia's comment on it. Uh, Sir Roger explains, the half-pay officers of Argyleshire meeting to settle a partition in relation to their widows filled the house, which is a very large inn uh, of the Dukes, and there is the inn in question at Inverary. Uh, they also viewed and described the castle. 
uh, the D of Argyll's house, a new building in the castle style, a square with four large round towers about, which in the middle rises the hall to a vast height, the whole embattled with flat coping and clumsy and ill-proportioned. With a lot more detail, Sir Roger sketched and described, and this is actually pretty interesting, you see just there, the corner doors. Uh, the doors into the towers are shut up by folding doors in the angles of the rooms, papered over as jib doors, so as to form the angle when shut undiscovered. Uh, I haven't been to Inverary Castle, perhaps some of you have, and tell me if the jib doors are still there. Well, at this point, we must leave the nudicates if we're to have any time for the Merricks. Uh, though the diary, their diary continues, uh, Sophia stops at Penrith, but his goes on right down to Manchester uh, and some description of the building of the Bridgewater Canal, which was in construction at that point. Uh, I have to say about the Merricks that their diary is particularly hard to read, uh, and I'm sure also that it's a fair copy uh, not one that was written on the road, it's too neat for that. And their extensive descriptions of church monuments become a bit tiresome. Uh, <laughs> and I think they must be taken from a guidebook as well. At one point they refer to a church four miles away they didn't visit with, quote, the sepulchral, sepulchral effigy of Rees at Meredith. And as they didn't go there, they can hardly have known that unless uh, somebody told them otherwise. However, uh, after editing out the churches and the even longer castle descriptions, we do find a few uh, intriguing, uh, uh, and I think, um, uh, well, anyway, intriguing items. Uh, at Conway, uh, as well as the castle and the church, they describe Plasma and this uh, interesting house, uh, which is recorded in several early views. Uh, in Castle Street is a very old house with a double bow window supported on brackets containing the three coin-joined legs of the Isle of Man, and that is uh, there, said to be the recognizances of the Stanley family. The underfront is highly carved and ornamented with five armorial bearings. It is called the College and is at present inhabited by the parish clerk. This is a more or less contemporary view uh, of this with the castle behind. The house survives, mm. but this window uh, has uh, disappeared. Sadly, it's an impressive piece of work. On the way to uh, Capel Curic, they were impressed by the road and the waterfalls. We regained the new government road to Ireland, without doubt the finest in the world, which is here made to wind through most romantic scenery. The next interesting object was Riada at Ewenot, excuse my Welsh pronunciation, or the Swallows Falls, descending by four widespread torrents into a rocky channel overshadowed by trees. But the most truly picturesque cataract is seen foaming from under Pontic in Sivin. This is a fine subject for the pencil, but unfortunately we don't have the drawings that perhaps they, they made. At the end of nine miles, we arrived at Capel Curig, uh, when Lord, where Lord Penryn, from a design by Wyatt, has built a large and comfortable inn with a most magnificent establishment of stables, etc. And I think this is the building that uh, we see there. The next day took them to Bangor, uh, a neat, clean town and beautifully situated nearly opposite the Bay of Beaumaris. And then a uh, pleasant walk led us to a boat ferry whence we passed over into Anglesey. The boatman pointed out to us the buttresses of the suspension bridge. The cent central uh, centre part where the chain will cross is 560 feet in width and the height will be 100 feet above high water mark. Uh, they were just in the process of building the towers and about to uh, raise the uh, the chain, uh, suspension chains in 1821. Uh, coming, this is all in one day. Coming back to Bangor, they stayed at the Castle Inn where we slept. The way to here, Henry Field, was remarkably civil and attentive. Our mayor this day had travelled 15 miles. After Carnarvon, they stayed at Beth Gellert, where they noticed the goats. Uh, they are small like sheep, all white and of a silken appearance, and the number we saw might be 30. The female peasants in Carnarvonshire have their stockings without feet, with a bit, but with a bit prolonged so as to fasten over the second toe. Uh, it rained there and they had to stay an extra day uh, before they uh, went on to uh, Porth Maddock and Tanny Bulch. Then, uh, after a hasty day dinner, we set out for uh, Dolgetli, 18 miles in addition to the 10 we had already come. That's actually longer than uh, the longest uh, mileage that I gave them before. Uh, this road lies over the tops of the mountains, cold, dreary, up and down, and being composed of large loose stones 
more resembles the bed of a former river than a turnpike road. Uh, they did note at the end of the day, passing by the grounds of blank Woodcock Esquire on our right, we soon came in sight of the d domain of Hengrist, Hengr the seat of Colonel Vaughan, once celebrated for its library of ancient Welsh manuscripts. Uh, from the village of Lanilted, we saw Cade Idris outstripping the other mountains. And interestingly, the comment about the manuscripts is well before the collection passed to the National Library of Wales. So it was clear it was celebrated. Uh, anyway, well, I think at this point uh, we must leave them and their long-suffering mayor. She was about to have a day's rest again. Uh, and I hope that uh, this journey taken with our uh, travellers has shown you some of what is really just a jeu d'esprit uh, and the enjoyment I've had uh, in reading them uh, in this journey of discovery. Uh, plenty of di di diaries out there, easy to find, but sometimes, as with our 1809 diarist, I think they give us, can give us unexpected insights into the past. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, Nat. And, uh, you didn't mangle the Welsh too badly. So <laughs> well, thank you for, for reassuring me. <laughs> no worse than I would have done. Um, so, um, with, uh, without more ado, has anyone got any questions? Yes. I, I was amazed to see one small horse and a very small what was it at the roof or something? Well, I don't know. I can only say they've got the one horse and whatever the horse was pulling, it isn't made yeah. clear. But how often did they change the poor horse? I mean, no, no never. It's never. their horse. Well, that's what you implied. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> our mare. Yes. She goes around, she occasionally gets fed, or regularly gets fed, <laughs> and occasionally gets a day's rest. But I thought it was quite an achievement for the mare over these Welsh mountains. Even after the ninety, whatever it was, ninety. No, no, that's 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 the that's proper coach with with post boys and horses yeah. changed as a you know whenever every ten fifteen miles. It's the the mayor is the only one who do it on a one horse uh, carriage. It will need a day's rest after that road over Transvaal. Uh, it would. Yes. I mean, Transvaal is the door to the mountains. So. <laughs> so well, they were coming out. Yeah, well, still you've got to get over the mountain to exactly. get down to. Yes, so they start from. Um, uh, Tremadoc and Portmadoc at Grand at sea level. Yes. Yeah. Uh, apart from the, the evidence of copying out guidebook descriptions of churches and castles, do you think they were influenced by what guidebooks were telling them to see or where to stay? Um, I expect they were. Uh, I have to say they've had least attention because um, I found the other ones so much more interesting. Um, the, certainly the, the, the guy would suggest you know, they're going to see, they know this church is going to have all these, these monuments since I think they must be reading it out of uh, an overall guide. I haven't tried to track down what guidebooks they might have been using in, in 1820 and see mm. if the texts there match what they saw. They make one or two detours like up to, to Conway which suggests that from um, wherever their land was they knew that they needed to go up there to see the sites. Very keen on the castles. Mm. Chris. Do you think they planned, planned these journeys out in advance, um, or they just said they'd go in the general direction of wherever and um, then made a decision from day to day, which, or mixture of two? Uh, the the Merricks, I think, probably planned it out in advance. They seem to be quite deliberate. You know, the next Edwardian castle, then they get to Bangor, see the castle there, go across to Beaumaris, and so on. Um, the others, uh, much less so. Uh, I feel they're travelling, uh, they know they're going to go broadly that way. The Newdigates are going to visit Edinburgh and Linlithgow Lin and Schoon uh, and uh, Glam's and then make their way back across. But I suspect they stopped, as it were, when they, when they got to where they could. Um, the, the 1809 traveller had obviously planned out his stops in the Lake District, but the way up there, I think, was probably somewhat ad hoc. Mm. 